the bullet. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, Gary's been a great help to me. Um, it's been nine months since I was here, and then the last time we were here, the preacher was uh, Brother Scott, and I believe it was his last Sunday to do that. So we come back and we don't get to hear the new guy because they asked me to do this. But I'm, um, so he's been a great help on the technical details of this. I'm, I don't know if it's easier in Jesus' day when there'd be huge crowds and no PA system <laughs> and no handouts. I don't know, I have a book of cartoons and one of them has Peter giving out handouts before Jesus speaks, but oh, I don't think that actually happened. Um, but I'm, I'm admiring, I haven't read all this yet, but some things caught my eye, uh, like what if we begin to treat our Bibles the way we treat our cell phones? And now we know from just now, you can have both in your pocket at the same time, right? You can really take your Bible with you everywhere you go because you can have that on your cell phone, right? Um, and, um, and then I just look at this, what, what we've been going through here in our worship assembly, and I think this is pretty much everything you know, I wanted to say this morning, so thanks for being here. <laughs> uh, we come every couple of years for this purpose, and more than any time in the past, I don't know why, I'm excited to be here. And I don't know if I, I one of Personalities, I don't, when I get really, really angry, I don't usually throw things. You know, I, and when I get really excited, you might not be able to tell from, from the way I act. I do, I, I have a group that I perform with, so I am a performer at sometimes, you know, entertainer, but that's not my purpose for being here today, so I don't know if you can tell, but I'm just really more than ever before excited to be here with you this week. And, um, like I said, I, I can't put my finger on it. In our first song, we, we use the word thrill. And that's a pretty extreme word. You know, but this moment, and this, this hour, it, it's a fit for me. And when we, were taking the, uh, when we were taking the Lord's Supper, we were thinking about that man from Ethiopia. And the word excited was used several times in that little talk. That he was excited about what he had discovered, what he learned about, and after coming up out of the water, and I don't know if drawing off was part of that or not, but he was excited about his new situation. And, um, and I, I, what I really want to get across this morning during our sermon hour is, is that thrill, is that excitement about being a part of, as we said, God's family. And, and this, one, this one hit me, this line, we all feel his grief. And to look at, at an auditorium where almost every seat is filled, and where I'm seeing, I know some of you are calling like me too, but I'm seeing some excitement in the faces of the people that I'm looking at. And, and that's really what I want to get across in the next few minutes. Um, 90, 120, whatever the next few minutes ends up being. Um, and, uh, is because we have this problem in various stages in life. Think about when you get a new car. Now, everybody's not the same, I realize. And for some of you, a new car is like, well, I got rid of that old thing. And whatever. But there's a certain thrill that some people get when they get a new car. And you get some things like this. Um, okay, we're not going to eat in the car. See how shiny it is? See how it smells? Does that smell like Wendy's to you? No, not me either. Okay, we're going to keep it that way. And, and I remember one call, car that I had where towels were put down on the seats. Towels that didn't look as good as the seat cover, but that was going to keep the seat covers looking really nice when you took the towels off. But after a while, you, you, I mean, it's real, you're really hungry and you're on the road and you have to drive through to get the number one. And a few years later, well, there's a whole bunch of trash in my back seat. Okay, here's my summary statement. The new wear is off. You get a new job, it's thrilling. Even if you're having to go through some kind of training to even understand what you're supposed to be doing, it's still there's a thrill. If that's a job you sought, <laughs> if you really wanted that job, 
and it's everything is great, right? And then after a while, you still you start getting on the boss's nerves, and he gets on your nerves, or she, even more, and the new wears off, right? Now, I would probably step on too many toes if I said there's an expression in marriage, the honeymoon is over. You know, and so some of the really great successful marriages that we admire, it's because the new doesn't wear off, because the thrill is still there year after year. And that's, of course, what, what we all want. Well, we're going to look at some things this morning about the church in the New Testament, in the early days. And I'm thinking if I were just given an opportunity to be around for a short time in the days of the early days, church, it'd be in those first few days when there was that thrill, when there was that excitement. Now, you know, if you were in the Bible class hour, I know not all, all you were able to do that. Yeah, what we intend to do on um, Sunday night, tonight through Thursday night, is sort of a word study on a New Testament Greek word. We're going to look at a couple passages this morning that do not contain that word. But that talk about the excitement, the thrill that they had when they were together early on. And the essence of the word that, that we are going to be talking about, about what we have in common, about what we do in common, is very evident in those verses. Years ago, I knew a couple who, um, they were both high school teachers. He was a band director, and she was a home ec teacher. Now, I felt a little bit of camaraderie with both of them. Now, this next part will not be on the test, so you don't have to pay attention. But the first college I went to, I studied to be a band director. The second college, I studied to be a preacher. And the third one, a computer programmer. But because of my first, the first college I went to, I studied to be a band director. I had sort of a bond with this band director. But I had a bond with his wife, too, I thought, because my mother was a home ec teacher. And we were homeschooled in home ec. All the other courses we had to go to the, up to the school building for. But home ec, we got that one at home. So I felt like I had a little bit of a bond with her, too. Well, she loved to tease her husband. And she would say this to him, and she'd say this to other people. Well, oh, it's the easiest job in the world, band director. All you have to do is go to the file cabinet, look through the files, pick out a song you like, give it to the kids and say, here, play this. Easy job, right? So I had to defend him. And as you know, the best defense is a good offense. We can say that during football season, can we? I'd say, you know, home at teacher, that's got to be the second easiest job in the world. All you have to do is go to the file cabinet, go through the files, pick out a recipe you like, and say, here, cook this. It's a little harder, though, than being a band director, because some days you have to go to a different file cabinet. Here, here's a pattern, so this. Well, we all know that's not quite that easy. Well, maybe you don't know that. You're hearing it from me. It's not quite that easy to be a band director. But there's, a, there's an element in truth in that, because the recipe, a pattern for fabric, a piece of music, all those are written instructions for something, aren't they? Now, you have to learn a few specialized things to read a recipe. It's very important to know the difference between TSP period and TBSP period. So there are a few little things you have to learn, but it's basically in our language. Now, to read the pattern, that takes a little bit more specialized knowledge. There may be some training in that. But it's still, when you know how to read it, it's written instructions. Here, so this. You can do that, right? Now, when it comes to music, which is what I'm teaching now, there, there are even more um, esoteric things you have to learn. You know, some hidden things in there. But once you know how to do it, it's written instructions. And you can duplicate what the Creator had in mind. But this is very important. If you don't follow the recipe, the pattern, the piece of music, you might get something, but it won't be what the Creator intended. Now, if anybody doubts this, go home or, or go online, go to the bookstore, find a recipe that calls for baking powder, 
and use baking soda instead. And then email me and let me know what. So I'm looking, I'll give you my email address. I want to know. I'm curious. I'm not brave enough to try it. So. so deviation from the recipe, from the pattern, from the sheet of music will get you something, but not what the creator intended. Now back home on Sunday morning, we're studying the book of Exodus. And we have a fellow that um, he works part-time with the, the church, and one of his jobs is tell us what to study every Sunday morning. So we went through the book of Deuteronomy, and it took well over a year. And I think I remember a few things out of this time through. Right now, he has this in Exodus, and before we started, he said, he didn't tell us every Sunday yet what we're going to do. We get a page at a time. There's not much to cover. And he said there are basically three things that happen in there. Number one, the Exodus, getting out of Egypt, the giving of the law, and the building of the tabernacle. Now, every time I do, I don't know if it will be different this time through or not, but every time I go through this reading about the building of the tabernacle, I get confused. It is written instructions, but there aren't any pictures. But I notice in, in uh, Exodus chapter 25, more than once, God says to Moses, be careful to do this the way I showed you to do it. So Moses had a little advantage over me. He got the written instructions, and he wrote them down so even I could read them today. But God showed him how to do it. Now you get to the time of Christ. We have written instructions on what the church is supposed to be like, don't we? And we, some of us are slow learners, and we come here week after week after week after week, right? You may be like me, you may have met some people on the way that came once and never came back. Wow, I wish I could learn stuff that way. I have to keep coming back to me after a week. You know, I'm not like those guys who just came once and got it. What I like about the scripture is they also showed us how to do it. And that's what the book of Acts is about. And I think that's why it's probably one of our favorites. You see how I'm dragging you along with me? One of our favorites to study, because we're, it's not just instruction, we are shown how to do it. And unfortunately, you get to just chapter 5 of the book of Acts, and already there's a problem, right? Remember a couple of hypocrites, I mean, Ananias and Sapphira, you know another Ananias, he's a good guy. But problem, chapter 6, there's some grumbling in the church. Um, the new has worn off. Well, not really, but you start seeing problems right away. The thrill that I'm thinking about today is right there in the second chapter, a little bit in the fourth chapter. Now, it was very well done for us earlier today, reading from the fourth chapter. But um, there's a similar passage in chapter two. And I want us to um, read a little bit from that. Um, Chapter 2, starting in verse 43. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, and all those who had believed were together. And they had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing with them all as one anyone might not have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness, Sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. We've called our series In Common. I say we, I did. We called this series For the Week In Common. And that relates to the word study that we're going to do. There's a phrase in this, in this passage and very similar thoughts in chapter 4. And you notice after hearing that reading in this there's a lot in common between the two passages. And, but one of the phrases there is all in common. That these people had all in common. In the early days, before there was a, a south side church and a north side church, before there was a black church and a white church, before there was an anti-church and a pro-church, or whatever the opposite is. Before there were all of those things, they were, they had all things in common. And they shared together in their lives. And so 
um, that's what we're looking at this morning. And that's what produced, at least for me when I read it and try to put myself in their sandals, that's what produces that thrill, that excitement. The things we've been singing about this morning where we are a family, where we have common love. Um, so the first one is found both in verse um, 44 in this reading and verse 32 in, in chapter 4. You might want to, it's just maybe one page from there, uh, look, at, look at it together. And it says that all believers were in common, or all believers were together. Um, this, this word believers is a typical designation in the New Testament for the group of people who are in had decided to follow Jesus. The word disciples is used a whole lot before it's actually what we call the church, but that word was used a whole lot after it also. These followers, learners from Jesus. And so they were learning about Jesus, and especially the ones when we, we use that in a broad term, all the followers of Christ, we use it more specific for the twelve that were also called apostles. Luke says he, he called some of his disciples apostles. But the term applies to all the followers of Jesus. So that's used a whole lot in the book of Acts also. Believers, uh, uh, the word Christian is used only three times in the New Testament, which is interesting because we use it a whole lot. But it's only used three times and always as a noun, never as an adjective. They don't, there's no nothing in the New Testament about a Christian radio station playing Christian rock music, that sort of thing. Or even for that matter, a Christian college or Christian family. But but Christian is a valid thing to call people who belong to Christ. But the word I like being used here is believers. We could do another study just on the word believe and believer. But it's more than just, hey, hey, uh, did you know, uh, did you, can you believe it? Uh, the Alabama football team won their game last night. Oh, yeah, I agree. You know, I've been changing my life. But I believe it. I mean, I consent to it. It's it's true. I believe it's true. I don't know why. Maybe it's hard to believe for some of you, but it's, I can believe that. But believe me, being a believer is so much deeper than that. And so this word is used to people who had, who were trusting, who were confident, who have put their confidence in Jesus Christ. That's what it means by believers. We're going to look before the series is over at. Um, some of that coming about. But um, believers, these people at this point, they had confidence in God. They put their trust in Him. They totally their lives were involved in His. So that's who we're talking about. Because not everybody in Acts 2 is a believer. Just the ones we get to read about and, and rejoice in and identify with. But all believers were together. But once again, this is before they had the South Side congregation and the North Side congregation. They were all together. And that's a huge group of people. And that's probably part of what generates the excitement. But I'm just as thrilled. I, I visit a lot of places. And I don't get the level of excitement everywhere as I do here at Franklin County. So it didn't have to be 3,000 people for it to be exciting. But that was part of it. They were all together, and they were all together in one place at part of the time as we read they're all together in each other's homes. But they're being together on a daily basis. They didn't just wait for Sunday for an hour or two on Sunday and say, well, let's be together. They're involved in each other's life uh, all along the way. But there's another thing that comes to my mind when I think about this idea of together, and that's the idea of unity. This is before there were dissensions within the church. They were to come. The honeymoon would be over, and they would have to fight the disunity that came up there. But you will remember... When Jesus prayed in the garden, He said, Father, I pray that they will all be one. Now, if that's not strong enough, He adds this, as you, Father, as you and I are one. Right? That sort of unity is what Jesus prayed for. And that's what they had in the beginning. That's exciting to me. Well, in, uh, also in both of these passages, we have the idea that they have all things in common. Uh, I did a little reading on uh, communes. Some of you aren't maybe old enough to remember that term. But back in the 1960s and 70s, yeah, I'm old enough to remember that. There were these things called communes. They still exist, but they were here back then. Where everybody just lived together, one big happy family, share everything, you have a few 
Is that what's being talked about here? Yes and no. The thing that really struck me is that the family unit is still intact all the way through the New Testament. Don't mess with the family. You've probably got some of the news we have over the last few years that will lead to the belief our society is not that big on family anymore. At least not the family as God defined it. And that's some of the thing they tried to do with these communes back in the hippie days, is to dissolve the idea of family. You know, so who's my mommy? Well, it doesn't matter. You know, it takes a village. <laughs> so it's really not the same thing, but there is something in common with that. And as, that is the idea that, well, yes, I know this. I have the deed to this, but if you need it, if you need to use it, I'm willing to share with you. There's another kind of related word, <clears throat> communism. Is what they had in the New Testament church in the early days communism? I know it's a rhetorical question. What I understand to be communism, and I did some reading, so I'm, I'm educated on this. The government controls everything. That's not the idea. That's not the idea here at all. But they had all things in common. They they shared the Lord. And we sung about that this morning. We use that word. Come share the Lord. They shared the Lord. And because of that, they shared their position also. Uh, you, I have certain um, I have had certain things in my possession. You know, that I had the deed to, you know, like a rake or something. That um, I don't have anymore. And I don't know who it is. But I have a pretty good suspicion that somebody else now is using it. And that's fine with me because I can buy another. Some things I can't afford, a new way to I used to have a big library of books. The termites got a bunch of them. But a bunch of them had just disappeared through the years. Somebody's getting some good out of them. I mentioned that in a Bible class many years ago that I used to have something called Young's Analytical Importance to the Bible. Well, I now, have, and I didn't have it anymore. I now had a new one because the class went together and bought me one. But that was, it's okay with me because I probably have some things in my possession that belonged to somebody else before. I don't know who's been this way. But as soon as he left it in my studio, I put it in my pocket. <laughs> That's not, I'm not talking about kleptomania here. I'm talking about this attitude that these people have that you, I have it, you need it, you can have it too. And this goes all the way back to John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, you have two coats, the other guy didn't have one, give him one of yours. Um, but uh, chapter 4, verse 33 brings up this idea, grace was on them all. This is what it is. Grace was on all of them. Grace is another important word in the scriptures, and one that is worthy of our, our study. But when I read this verse, I thought of a big contrast. Back in the days of Noah, in the days of Noah, there's a very extreme statement that says, God looked at man and he saw that the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. All the thoughts of his life, of his heart, were only evil continually. Can you get better than a triple superlative? Probably. But I don't need it to be. In contrast to that, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These people, they all found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that a good way to get started? You got a new institution, 3,000 people the first day, that's a good strong start. And for grace to be on all of them, that's wonderful. As a result of that then, and we'll talk more about this as the, as the week goes on also, so we won't go into a lot of detail here, but there are two things from chapter 4, verse 34, and also in chapter 2 in a couple of places. All who were able shared their possessions. That's what I like about being in a free society and practicing voluntary communism, if you want to call it. Nobody comes along and says, hey, Russell, that rake you have, somebody else needs that. We're going to take it away from you and give it to somebody. It was those who were able that shared. So there was no rule, okay, the five steps to becoming a Christian, step number five is 
You have to give away your stuff. So all who are able share. Well, who got shared with? All who had need. And God worked this out in this, this system, in this society, that if you need something, you have it. If you have something and somebody else needs it, if you're able, you share. And all this goes together then in this environment, in this setting, that gives me a thrill when I read about it. I'm glad to be part of a place back home where I can be thrilled almost every time I am there. I mean, in a mic that's not a lot. So. Uh, almost every time there, there's a certain level of thrill that I feel. When I come here every time, I, I feel that excitement. And I, and I get it from most of the rest of you. And, uh, and that's what I want. I would love to share that with the world. Because I can go in there and say, let me tell you the right doctrine. And somebody searching for the right doctrine will listen. But if we can get some people hanging around us that can feel the thrill that we feel when we're together, that might generate some interest. There was a, when I was still in high school, I took a young lady to church with me one night. The only comment I remember her making afterward included a word that's probably not in your dictionary. She said that was the hugging, hugging us, hugging us group of people I've ever seen. It's a tongue twister even to this day. Probably that's the huggingest group of people I've ever seen. She was seeing people that were thrilled to be together. That's what I would love to share with the world. This morning we share it together, and there may be some things on our minds. I may be thinking there are some things I could do to make it more thrilling to be a part of God's family. What do I need? And so I will, I will need to make some decisions in my own head as we sing this song in just a few minutes. There may be some of you, I don't know all of you here, there may be some that really aren't a part of God's family yet and will want to take advantage of the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to ask you to come up and sing this song together as we make whatever we need to. Let's stand as we stand.